Hello. Hi, this is Gregor Gillespie. This is he. Hi, this is Steve Juin for MMA Mania. Thanks for taking my call today. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. Hey, I'm glad to get a chance to talk to you and uh, appreciate Mike setting this up for us. So let's jump right into it. You're at Ring of Combat 50 this Friday. They call it the American Idol of MMA, and you'll be fighting Justin Stewart. So how are you feeling about the fight going into Friday night? Just like any other fight, um, you know, it's the game plan is always the same. It doesn't matter whether it's a guy I've never heard of or Donald Cerrone or whoever. It doesn't really matter to me. The game plan is the same. Uh, be aggressive. Be ready for a fight. Uh, anything can happen. Uh, I try not to, <laughs> I try not to really judge my opponent too much on anything that they've done or where they come from or anything along those lines. It's a fight. Anything can happen and I expect it to be a tough one. Uh, just like my last three fights and just like any upcoming fight that I'll have in the future. Right, but at the same time, it's almost impossible to scout a guy with a zero and zero record. He can he can at least look at your last three fights in Ring of Combat and get a little bit of an idea about you. I didn't scout my last three guys either, and they all Uh-oh. had zero fights. That does, like I said, that doesn't matter. I, you know, I'm a big advocate on this. And I think this comes from my wrestling coach in college, Tim Flynn, uh, at Edinburgh University. We don't really take a, a too hard a look at what the other guy does. I think we need to focus more on what I do good. Uh, you know, and if I can execute what I do well, I won't have to worry as much about what the other guy does. Um, you know, and that's kind of been my mentality throughout my, uh, my career, and it seemed to work so far, so, you know, why, why change it now? Well, speaking of Edinburgh, I wanted to talk to you about that a little bit, because hey, you got tagged as a prospect coming out of school before you even had your first fight, because you were a four-time All-American, 153 and 12. A lot of people thought you were the next big thing coming out at lightweight, and you hadn't even signed with anybody yet. Well, you know, my uh, kicking off my MMA career seemed to, uh, turned out to be quite a project. Uh, hold on a second. Sorry, my brother's driving right now, and I'm telling him the direction. He comes and helps me out the week of my fight every time, and he chauffeurs me around. No problem. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my career, it was hard. It was, like, tough to launch. Um, I moved to Long Island three and a half years ago to take a coaching position at Hofstra University. I started messing around fighting and immediately knew I loved it and I wanted to do it. Um, it took, I think my first scheduled MMA fight was November of 2012. Uh, I was sparring with, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ryan LaFlair. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, he's in the UFC. He's undefeated. He's very, 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 very good. Uh, I was sparring with him three weeks off my first schedule on an A fight in uh, November 2012. And, uh, the lefty threw a nasty left leg kick at me. I blocked it with my right forearm. It snapped my forearm in half. I had to have, uh, surgery to put a plate in my bone and fix that. Long story short, I ended up being out and I didn't have my first MMA fight until January of 2014. Well, that was because uh, you got a staph infection too, right? My bone, yeah. I just I had, I had MRSA in my bone um, for you know quite a while. But I had a peck line in my arm, and I was walking around the backpack with an IV hooked up to my vein that goes into my heart. But uh, then once I got that out, getting me an opponent, I, we went through like five different organizations and shows trying to get me an opponent, and uh, we went through I think four or five that pulled out at the last second or. They wouldn't clear me to fight in Pennsylvania because I had zero amateur experience. Um, and it was just kind of a, the whole, the whole thing was like a debacle. It was just, just a lot of nonsense. And finally, Lou Negley at Ring of Combat got me in. Um, and, uh, you know, that's been my 2014. He's got me on every show and with consistent opponents and they know they're taking care of me. Yeah, and it's been working out well for you because not a single fight has gone out of the first round for you. You win by TKO, rear naked choke, arm triangle. You're just getting people out of there fast in each fight. Yeah, well, uh, actually, I'll correct you on that because I think with uh, on the website, they say that I haven't gone out of the first round. My second fight, I went to the second round. I, I choked them out with rear naked in the second fight. Oh, okay, so I apologize. Yeah, that, that, no, that's, 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 I think that's actually misinformation on the Internet. Um, yeah, but it was first round, second round, first round. Either way, it's still an impressive run to, you know, go 3-0 and and get through people in under two rounds in each fight. Yeah, um, I mean, again, I think I'm doing what's expected of me. Uh, I was a finisher when I wrestled, and I like being a finisher 
when I fight. And I don't want to say that I don't think that you can win without finishing the guy, but I think the ultimate feeling of victory is finishing the guy, and there's absolutely no question that you won if you finish him. You know, I don't want to have a close battle where the refs, you know, have a split decision. I, I dread that. And again, I think there will be, a, there come a time in my career down the road that maybe that happens and I have to win a tight one. There's good guys out there, but I want to keep finishing everyone as long as I can. I was a finisher when I wrestled and I would be a finisher now. And Edinburgh seems to turn out finishers too because, uh, Josh Koscheck, Justin Wilcox, there are a ton of guys coming out of there who go into MMA and are very successful. So. Chris Honeycock. Uh, exactly. So yeah. how, how quickly did you pick up the, you know, boxing and kickboxing and jujitsu when you came out of college? Uh, I actually sat for close to, uh, my last NCAA tournament was 2009. I didn't compete again. I thought I was done. I didn't compete with anything for, um, Almost two years. I wrestled in the 2011 U.S. Open, 2011 World Team Trials. Um, and then I moved to Long Island, and then I started fighting. So I think it was two and a half years or so after college that I started boxing. And I remember sitting with someone a long time ago watching Frank Yeager fight on a UFC card. Um not many people, well, not, not everyone knows this, but I don't drink anymore. I haven't in quite some time. I was drinking some beers with some friends. Um, and they're, you should do this, man. You should do this. This is in 2009 after I was done wrestling. So I'll never fucking fight. I'll never do that. I never want to compete again. I never want to do that. Yada, yada, yada. Long story short, here I am. And now I'm fighting. I hate to ask, but it seems like there's a story there when you say that you don't drink anymore. And I'm wondering what the decision was like for you. Uh, it was an, an easy decision. And it, it was a, all right, so it was an easy decision to stop drinking, but it was a tough decision to execute, if you catch my drift. I know, I know, uh, I know what that's like. Yeah, well, I haven't drank or used in over four and a half years now. In May, it'll be five years. It was just a, a mental shift to stay healthier and, and be more competitive. Nah, it was more like, uh, more like a life or death necessity that I stopped doing what I was doing. If I continued on the path that I was going, it wasn't going to lead to anywhere but bad places. Yeah. Well, I, I personal experience with that, seeing a cousin who had kidney failure from overdoing it. So that was kind of my wake up call. Everybody has one at some point. Yep. Well, you know, it's, uh, that's my personality and it's, I have to be careful where I aim my personality. Um, I'm obsessive. Uh, I'm addictive. And everything that I do, I have a tattoo across the front of my neck that says one or one hundred. And that tattoo means one is too many and one hundred is not enough. And what that means is, uh, what that means is it could be anything from cupcakes to beer or a handful of pills. It doesn't matter. One is too many or one hundred is not enough. So anything that I like, I have a tough time just having a moderate amount of. And that means I can go, you know, back when I was a kid, I wanted a fish tank, and I ended up with a 125-gallon fish tank in my 12-foot by 12-foot bedroom. That's wow. a seven-foot long. <laughs> you know, that, that's my personality. Well, I guess that if you're going to be one to 100, you might as well be 100 in something that requires it like mixed martial arts because you got to be very driven and very focused to succeed in the sport. Yeah, of course. So, but, uh, yeah, that's kind of, that's my personality, though, and, Anyone that'll tell you, I've had four cheat meals in four years. I've eaten the same thing every day, every day, every time, every uh, meal, every portion has been the same for four years, except for Thanksgiving a few years ago and uh, after my three fights. All right. Well, then, uh, what what do you eat to get ready for a fight? What goes into the body to keep you a well fueled athlete? Well, that's a secret. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I'm kidding. It's, I won't give you the 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 the, the short story is coffee with protein in it. Uh, egg whites, two yolks, um, a couple pieces of whole grain bread, a scoop of peanut butter, um, a Greek yogurt, an apple, pear, uh, brown rice, asparagus, and uh, beef, lean beef. That's the that's the short story. I just talked so. to Georgie Caracanian last week, and he seemed to think that meatless was the way to go. He said that he's actually a better, healthier fighter since he went vegan. Do you ever give any thought to that? Negative. I will never, ever do that. That's something I, I 
maybe the way that some people don't train like I train. And the way that I train, I'm not saying is the only way to be successful because there's more than one way to skin a cat. But from my experience, the way that I train, if I don't eat meat, I'll dwindle away to nothing. I mean, I have to, have to, have to eat meat. I have no other option as but to eat meat. Um, when I say that, I eat a pound and a half of flank steak or filet every night. I have to. I'm, I've got my blood track and my cholesterol fine. I was, oh, you're going to have bad cholesterol. You know, that's nonsense. I work out three times a day. I run 32 miles a week. I bike uh, close to 200 miles a week. So I, if I don't have meat, I would be 125 pounder. I couldn't lift anyone up. Oh, well, yeah. And it's kind of funny you say that because it's one of the things Kurt Kanyan said to me was that he used to walk around at, like, middleweight, welterweight size when he was eating meat. And when he stopped eating the meat, that's how he got down to featherweight. Right, and that's silly. For me, the way I, the way that I fight involves so much strength and like power. Everything I do involves being stronger than the guy that I'm competing against. To maintain that strength, what weight do you cut down from to, to be able to fight at lightweight? Well, like I said, the, my, uh, my diet's the same year round for the last four years, so my, my weight doesn't fluctuate too much. Um, but 170, um, until about, you know, two weeks, three weeks off from the fight, and then it'll come down to uh, 164 or 5. So I, the last eight or nine pounds is just water. But I would say year-round, I'm around 170. But I could easily be 185. And, I mean, easily I could be 185. But that's not really realistic. And I said, oh, man, holding your weights on that low artificially year-round is that... I'm not holding it down. It's just where my body levels out at when I'm training as much as I train. And I think it's silly to weigh 180 or 185. The most I'm going to weigh when I fight is 170 or 172. You know what I mean? Like, you can only gain so much weight overnight. Right, and you can so only it, cut you can only cut so much, too. Something you know as a wrestler all well that, you know, you try to yeah. put on weight too much, you're not going to make that weight class when you try to cut. Well, and if you do make it, you can't really, I mean, there's very few guys that can put more than 20 pounds in in a 24-hour period and in back into their body, you know what I mean? Right. So, like, if you can put 20 pounds back in your body, you might actually be, like, hurting the next day. The lower back hurts, you can't breathe as well. I think that that's a tough thing to do, is put 20 pounds back in. So, realistically, when I check my weight the day of my fight, like, so I weighed in, I've eaten, the next day I've eaten again, I've drank a lot. Um, the next day I typically weigh about 172. So, um, you know, that's 16 pounds. So why would I train at 180 or 185 if I'm never in a weight? Right, exactly. The only reason you would maybe if you uh, continue to dominate so much at lightweight that you decide to move up a weight class to try your luck there. No, Ryan the Flares made sure that I never go to that weight class. <laughs> also, I met him on a weekly basis. I've never sparred him since. I vowed that day that I'll never spar him. <laughs> and we're good buddies. Me and Ryan are good buddies. Um, I train at his gym on every Thursday with him. But uh, he is a nasty, nasty guy to spar. I'll tell you. I, I would hate to have to fight him with no shin pads on. And, uh, God, that just sounds terrible. Well, I, I don't think anybody's had an easy time with him. Like you said, he's undefeated and uh, beat John Jim State person. Howard in his last fight, so he's he's been rolling. He, he's a mean guy. A mean, mean guy. When he kicks you, he kicks with bad intentions. That left leg is coming to your head, and he wants to break you with it. Well, we've seen a lot of kicks with bad intentions. I mean, Donald Cerrone, you mentioned him earlier on in the interview, and in 15 days span, we saw him throw a lot of kicks at two different opponents. Yeah, I'll tell you what, man. A lot of people thought Henderson won that fight. I didn't think so. I thought Cerrone dominated that fight. Yeah, I thought he had at least two out of three rounds. There was only one that was close. That's what I thought. He was moving forward the whole time, and a lot of the stuff that Henderson was landing was like those side punches and those side kicks to the front leg. I don't think those are very significant strikes, but I I think Cerrone is a great fighter. Is that somebody that you want to fight eventually if you continue down this path? You know what? And I hate to say this because like, I don't like to give anyone any credit um, until they've earned it personally from me. But that dude's a tough, tough fighter, and I think he would give me a problem. Like I, that would be a guy that I, you know, because I look forward to my career. I look forward in my career, and I can see myself fighting guys in the top ten. I think there's top ten guys that I can beat right now, like tomorrow. If I was fighting with some of those top ten guys, I think I could beat some of them on Friday. 
I don't know if Donald Cerrone is the best matchup for me. Like, that's a guy that I think would give me problems. He's long, he's rangy, he's got vicious kicks, you know. I think he's pretty good off his back, so, you know. But I think of any of he's the most dangerous guy to wait, to be completely honest with you. Yeah, well, he's proved it. He's won seven straight, and the only guy that beat him is the current number one contender, Rafael Dos Anjos. So there's very few people who have anything to say to him. We'll keep the focus on your upcoming fight, though, because you're going to be competing at Ring of Honor Combat 50 on Friday, and it's going to be on pay-per-view and GFL.TV as well. So do you feel any pressure from knowing that it's going out to that big of an audience? Someone asked me that the other day, and my response to them was the exact same thing I'm going to tell you. I wrestled on ESPN in front of millions of fans on one mat in the stadium where the Detroit Pistons play in front of 30,000 fans live. Um, I have no problem with it being televised. But to answer your question, is I wrestled on ESPN, so no, that doesn't bother me. Right, that's true. Yeah, you, <laughs> you've been at the highest level in front of the biggest audience already. And uh, hey, on that note, I have to ask, are there any thoughts of uh, going out for the Olympics? No. Um, well, here's the deal. I mean, I was uh, pursuing very briefly for a short period of time in 2011, the Olympic dream. And uh, when I started messing around with fighting, I had to make a choice. Do I continue wrestling or do I pursue this new career of fighting? And I think a huge uh, influence on that decision was uh, the fact that the best guy in the world at any weight class is at, in the U.S., and that's Jordan Burroughs. That's, uh, that's a tough one to beat. If you can't beat Burroughs, you don't go to the Olympics, you don't go to the world. So you might be the second best guy in the world, and you never get to wrestle at the Worlds, you know. So um, it's your question now. Hi. My my competitive wrestling career is over unless Flow Wrestling wants to throw me in one of their uh, full Premier League bouts. I, I'm certainly not going to argue with Jordan Burroughs because he's the guy that's local to me. So yeah, he uh, he took me out my senior year in the semifinals of the nationals. I wrestled him before. Well, <laughs> he may have taken you out then, but you're taking out everybody now in ring combat. So yeah, so far so good. Yep, and you're looking to go four and zero with another win this Friday. So yep, sure. I, I want to give you this chance before I wrap it up to throw out some plugs to your team, sponsors, yeah. social media, anything that you want to get out there. Well, obviously, I want to thank my coaches, Keith Trimble, Dumbo Kickboxing. Uh, he's like my Long Island dad, family to me down here. He's my my ma- my manager, my agent, my coach, my head coach. He's, you know, everything down here as far as that goes. Uh, Joe Skrull is my jiu-jitsu coach. Uh, something in, with, with Iron Hand that would be quick at uh, – uh, you know, obviously I learned a lot from him. Uh, he has a special way of teaching and that reaches me and I, it gets through to me like none other coach has. Uh, Cal Sermonera is my wrestling coach. Uh, there's not a person in this world that's better for me mentally to have around than him. Uh, my brother who comes down here is my brother Toro who comes down here and helps me the week of my fights. He's going to the store in a few minutes here to pick me up some goodies. So he takes care of me the week of my fight. Um, my head wrestling coach in college, Tim Flynn. Uh, my training partners, uh, first and foremost, Andre Harrison, uh, former Rain Combat Champions in Titan now. Um, uh, Jared Gordon from uh, CFFC, he sparred a lot with me for this fight. I think almost every time he sparred with me, Levon Makashvili sparred with me quite a few times for this fight. Um, yeah, I mean, all those guys. Um, and I have too many sponsors to thank. But um, a few of the big ones, Mark Bloom with Network Realty, um, Sunrise Try, Hit. Um, there's a few of the big ones. Uh, the George family. Oh, that's, uh, those are a few of the big ones. The Binder family. But, oh, you know, I have too many other ones to, to name. But I think I just... I just like quite a few people there. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And any social media? People don't get it though. It's not a one man operation. You know, I could literally, I could spend more time naming the people that have helped me get to where I'm at than, than the whole interview that we've done so far. You know what I mean? That's like, true. There's, there's, it's not a one man operation. It's, a, you know, it's a, a million little things happening with a million different people that are, that go into this whole thing. It's not just, you know, I need three of my training partners. I've got 50 of them. You know what I mean? Right. Every successful fighter has a team behind them. That's how you get ahead in the sport. Yeah. 
Well, Gregor, I really appreciate the time today, and we're looking forward to seeing you compete at Ring of Combat 50 this Friday. They call it the American Idol of MMA, and if that's the case, I hope you get the thumbs up from everybody there. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. No problem. Have a great day.